All right, dry sump. As the name implies, the sump is dry, but it's not. It just means that the oil isn't stored there. So this would obviously be an overhead view because it wouldn't work if it was actually set up like this. So the idea behind a dry sump engine is that the oil is not stored in the sump on the engine. It's got to be sent somewhere else because there's no room under it. So let's see how bad this one gets. So let me see. We have the oil tank, which is mounted on the firewall typically or on the motor mount or something like that. It's usually about the same height as the engine. doesn't necessarily have to be. So the oil tank, it's going to go, a suction is going to go into the oil pressure pump, which is the same pump that you have. It's just, it doesn't, it's not external. Don't let this fool you. So it's part of the engine driven pump. It's internal to the engine and it just like it sucks oil up from the sump, the wet sump, it's going to suck it from the uh, oil tank, which sometimes is even a little bit higher than that. So it makes it real easy. So it comes up through the oil pressure pump. Oh dear Lord. And then it does not go through a scavenge pump. Um, it goes from the pressure pump into the engine and feeds the engine. This is not right. Yeah, this is so weird. I don't then, right at all. then it goes through the whole engine, right? And then it falls down just like it did before. So everything, it, once it goes through the, the oil pressure pump, it's the same oil pressure pump, goes through the whole engine, does everything the same. Then it drops down into the sump where it's not much room. So you have a scavenge pump. The scavenge pump picks it up and then, oh boy, um, sends it, through the oil cooler on this one, cools it as it comes out of the engine, which is normal, and then into the oil tank. All right, and so picks it back up. Pressure pump, what do we have off the pressure pump? Oil temp. Why there's two oil temp gauges, I do not know. There's one oil. Or two place. Yeah, there's uh, this makes no sense. There's yeah, there's one oil temp. So Here's the important points, and I'll try, hopefully I can write them down. Number one, it goes oil pressure pump, oil temp as it goes into the engine. Yes. You want to know what the temp is as it goes into the engine. You don't get to know what it is coming out. They don't want to scare you, right, or the pilots. We're, we're, we will freak us out. So I'll tell you, it's, so what's best case scenario? Where's the coolest oil? Right after the cooler. Well, after the cooler, then it goes into the big tank. Right before the right oil before tank. And then the tank, you know, it's got air blown across it. It gets a little bit better. And then we suck it up. And right before it goes into the engine, I'll tell you what it is. So pressure pump goes into the engine, does its thing in the engine, just like normal, falls to the bottom. Scavenge pump, which is always bigger than the pressure pump. Scavenge pump is one and a half to two times larger. I think the book says two times, but the ones I worked on are about one and a half times. The size of the oil pressure pump. Why is the scavenge pump bigger? So you never overfill the engine. You always can put engine back into the oil tank. It's not give a good thought. Or the oil tank's always got oil in it. Yeah, it makes sense. But, but the reason why is because the oil has been aerated and is foamy and, and larger volume now. So scavenge pump goes to the oil cooler, oil cooler to the tank. So it's harder to pump the oil once it's foamy? Not harder. It's just more. <coughs> it's got more volume takes more space because it's got all foamy and stuff. So was it an aircraft a scavenge pump? Is that going to be engine driven or is that going to be... It's engine driven. Like on my Continental. On the Continental, my Continental, my Continental doesn't have a scavenge pump, but the ones that I have worked on have scavenge pumps. Um, it is kind of a duplex pump. So half of it is pressure, half of it is scavenge. I like this one better. To be, to be honest, I think this came out of your book. It's the new version. I just feel, oh, good, uh, oil schematic for a dry sump. I should put this in here. And now I'm looking at it going, oh, I wish it wouldn't have. Um, and I went backwards the wrong way. So there we go. This one is more correct. And I believe this is out of Bonanza. And I wrote all these notes down here to remind me. So oil system in Bonanza's oil system. Oil is fed to the oil. Let's just look at it. So this makes more sense. We have the cooler and the tank, right? So we have the tank, which is not down below. It's up higher. So we have the oil tank, 
oil gets sucked from the oil tank through the in this case, we've got the oil temp bulb, screen, check valve. Everything. I don't know if that's correct, but we're taking oil before it goes, goes the engine. Pressure pump goes through the pressure pump, feeds the engine, falls into the dry sump. It is sent back to the oil tank by a scavenger pump that is stronger than the pressure pump. Right, larger, and then it's going to go the, the, the cooler. Uh, let me see. Oil is fed to the engine pump from a supply tank mounted just above and behind the engine. Above and behind. The oil return is picked, uh, oil return is picked up by a scavenge pump and returned to the supply tank, passing through a cooler, which is an integral part of the tank. The oil tank capacity is... Uh, that doesn't make sense. Two, two dash... Two, and a half. two gallons? Two... I two cut and paste this. Gallons. That's what it is. Nah, it's like ten gallons. Um, whatever. The filler neck and the A35 is accessible raising left engine cowling. Oh, yeah, I did cut and copy paste. B35 is next door. That's not important. Level should be checked after each flight. It is really good. Oh, oil. Probably this tank right here. Like two to one and a half gallons is probably what it was. Uh, let's see. The level should be checked after each flight using the dipstick. Well, it's not a dipstick. It's a oil level gauge. Uh, the normal operating level should be maintained 8 to 10 quarts. Both oil pumps, the oil screen, and check valve. Okay, so, oh yeah, both oil pumps, the screen, oh, this is terrible writing, there is a check valve, where is my check valve, because the oil tank is actually above, this is drawn bad, the oil tank is up here, above the pressure pump and scavenge pump, what happens to the oil in the tank when the engine's not running? It fills this way and fills up the crankcase. So you come along and you check the oil, which is right here, and you say it's low. It's low, so we need to add, wow, six quarts. So you put six quarts in the oil cooler and start up the engine. Where was the six quarts? In the engine. It was in the engine. So they start it up. Within a few seconds, the scavenge pump takes all the oil that was filling up the crankcase, blows it into the cooler, and now has many, many quarts and blows it out of this right here overboard making a huge mess and a fire hazard. So there is a check valve. No, they did put it right there, check valve. So notice the check valve is so the oil goes this way. So you think, well, then how does it stop it? Well, they put a spring or something on it, a lightweight spring. So it takes pump suction to open up the spring, not head pressure from the oil. So you gotta have that. So what happens if your check valve breaks? Yellow oil. What happens if it leaks? Yeah, it's going to go in here, so you have to run it before you check the oil, which is kind of a dangerous thing to do, but um, you got to do that. You can't, uh, how much typically would be in there? You can't, if you think you have low oil, could you drain it from the engine case? Could you just do all the check the engine case and see if it's six really, quarts come out? It's really hard. Could you hand prop it? Oh, that's really hard to do. Yeah, you could. No, you don't want to hand prop a six cylinder. It sucks. Yeah. Uh, bonanzas have at a minimum at E185, which is 470 cubic inch. So they're, they're not fun to pull through. Um, the Rotax, which I don't have notes or anything for, the Rotax does not use a scavenge pump, but it is a dry sump system. So you have a tank, pressure pump, goes into the engine, does its thing in the engine, falls down into the engine case, how does it get back to the oil tank? Oil tank's lower? Mm -mm, it's higher. Oil tank's higher. Pressure. pressure. So they use pressure blow-by from the pistons and the cylinders to pressurize the crankcase. Crankcase pressurizes. Air comes down, forcing this way, forcing the oil out and up. So how do you check the oil in a Rotax? I think we talked about this. And you have to like run it for a while, right? Yeah, you, no, you don't you run it. Pump, you have to pump it through until something. You hand prop it only in the direction of rotation and you pull it through many blades 20 or so and you take the top off and you hear this burp gurgle burp and you're like what is that well it's the oil being pushed out of the crankcase up into the oil tank now it's in the oil tank now you can check it because it only holds like three quarts and we never rotate a rotax backwards because sucks the air in induces air into the tappets, 
and the tappets do not self bleed. So you'd have to bleed them. All right. Mm -mm. That's to check. That's to burp it. If you get air in the tap, but you got to bleed it. There's a bleeding procedure. Okay, I just remember reading it. No, don't, that's not true. <laughs> yeah. Is, besides Rotax, is there other oil systems that, create, that form problems when there's air in the system? Not that I'm aware of. Do, do other. Oh, wait. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he just answered my question. Uh, I kind of just. Opened how would you bleed it out? The Rotax procedure? I don't remember offhand. I have it written out. You have to disconnect lines, open up fittings, okay. pull it through. So hydraulic tappets don't have the same problem as the Rotax ones? Is that what Jack just asked? Rotax has hydraulic tappets that are very picky. You can't have air in them. They don't self-bleed. So you got to bleed the system and make sure that everything is done correctly. And it's quite a procedure, which I went through it when I was in Rotax school, but I haven't done it since and I forgot. So, but our legacy engines, which are? <laughs> no problems, they're, they're self-bleeding. We put them together dry. All right, operation of a wet sump. Let's see if I can make this a little less like complicated or more complicated. So oil is kept in, I said interval sump. Oh, wet sump, I'm sorry, wet sump. I have a wet sump, yes, we're talking about wet sump. Um, do I need to go for wet sump? Going back to wet sump? Yeah, I have operation of a wet sump. So oil's kept in an integral, let's see what oil so be, yes, integral. Integral sump means it's part of the engine. That's where your oil's kept. That's what you have, right? Yes. So maybe I can abbreviate this. Oil is picked up. Picked up through what? Oil, oil pickup tube. Through an oil pickup tube. That is correct. And where does it go from there? Up a galley. Into to the oil pump. To oil pump. So from the oil pump, we'll make that B. We'll make this C. From oil pump to where does it go next? Um, you are all correct. I wrote a couple of weird things that maybe aren't quite in order. I have oil cooler bypass. Which means either to oil cooler or engine. Let's see here. Let's go back. That is correct. Oil pump, oil cooler bypass. You guys don't have an oil cooler bypass. You don't even have this system on there. So you disregard that. But it is on a lot of light combings put underneath where your oil screen goes. It's an adapter on many of them. So that's why it's there before the filter because it's literally put on the back of the accessory case and then the filter goes after that. So that's why it does that. All right, to oil cooler bypass. So from the pump, next thing would be oil cooler bypass. If you have it, what comes next? Oil screen. Okay, pressure screen. Or filter, depending on what you have. In that assembly, what is it going to have? In case the filter clogs? Oil bypass valve. Has a bypass valve in there somewhere. Uh, then what are we going to do next? Now we want to know the oil temp. Yeah, temp oil temp. temp sensor. Oil temp sensor. It's right on top. Oil temp sensor. Um, I will just mention that. I never remember, but. 
light combings aren't all set up exactly the same. And so some of them have this vernotherm valve. Wherever it went. There it is, right in front of me. Is on top of the engine right next to the oil temp bulb. And sometimes when this works like it's supposed to and it's sending the oil to the oil cooler, it leaks a little bit and it leaks some pretty hot oil across the oil temple giving you a false indication so i've heard that happen it's like your oil is actually pretty cold but it's leaking on the hot oil is leaking past this onto the temp bulb instead of coming around the right way and so it appears that you have a high oil temp just something to think about things don't always what they say let me see oil cooler oil temp um oh and i got oil pressure then what's next oil pressure relief valve what is that valve there for Regulate the oil pressure. Oil that is bypassed through that little valve goes where? Back to the sump. Falls right down to the sump. Goes, opens that little ball valve straight down. All right, uh, then it's going to go two engine components. We got the pressure, drip, spray. We already went over all of that stuff. And then oil drains. Drains to what? The to the sump. And it starts all over again. So I think, what are the big Q&A questions on there? I think they want to know big time, where is oil pressure taken? Or where is oil temp taken? Yeah. Oil temp is before it goes in the engine. Oil pressure, they don't ask that question, I don't think. All right, operation of a dry sump. Where is oil pressure taken? Oil pressure is taken after the pump. On your engine specifically, it's on the left side of the accessory case up high, kind of high. But why, why, would you, why would you want it to be after all that? You pressure? don't, as I'm thinking it through. Uh, pressure screen relief. Your pressure is taken right about here. Would you want it to be like after everything? Continental is. Mine's all the way down by one of the lower oil galleries on the left hand side. <coughs> so. Accessory case. What's that? On the accessory case in the, like one o'clock position. Uh huh. Is that where it's tapped off from? I mean, more like 11 o'clock. Um, Wait a minute. Is the right side? So when you're, when you're behind the engine, yeah, I'd be off. The it's like 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Oh, yeah. yeah, like 2 o'clock. Yeah, yeah we'll turn around this way. I was thinking about this way. It's over here. Yeah, well, it's my 1 o'clock, yes. We're, we're dancing. After the oil goes to the idler valve and after it's come out of the pump, right before it goes into the case, there's a tap right there. That is correct. And that's where it goes to the reflector. Yes. That is correct. You are correct. Uh, my big light combing, it is all the way down through. It is right here, down in this area. So in the, in the linear though, like a linear, like if you drew it out just linearly, like not. Mine is like after a bunch of stuff. Yeah, so is it is it important to have it after stuff or is it kind of arbitrary? Well, what I'm saying is, Light combing does it right up front. Continental does it near the end. So it's 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 essentially arbitrary. Like instead of like it must be. But the thing that I have noticed is light combing tends to want higher oil pressure. Continental lets it be lower. So what is the difference though? In Continental, it seems to be taken near the end. Well, light combing it's taken in the beginning. So I've already had a bunch of bleed off before it gets to my. It's like they let you have your worst case scenario for the oil pressure. Like it's like this is. Like the lowest it is at the end. Like, oh, yeah. Your oil pressure right where it matters. Where it matters. So maybe I don't know quite the answer to that one. I just. Oh, yeah, you say you want your oil pressure to be higher? Just, yeah. just move the sensor. Move the sensor. Come on. Uh, let me see. Where was I here? Operation. Okay. So we have the oil tank. Oil tank. Um, so oil tank. is mounted on firewall. 
or to the motor mounts. Uh, you have one for each engine. So multi-engine, you'd have multi. Uh, the outlet, outlet is near the lowest point. A second outlet may be provided for emergency use of the prop. A second outlet below normal outlet may be provided for trying to abbreviate stuff for feathering option of prop. We'll talk more about that when we get to propellers, but if you lose an engine or shut down an engine in a multi-engine aircraft, you can't have the prop windmilling. So like on my aircraft, or I have a single engine, right? So if something catastrophic happens and I want to shut down the motor, well, I can turn off the ignition, I can turn off the fuel, but that engine prop is just going to keep on windmilling and I can't stop it. There's nothing I can do about that. The drag on it is equivalent to the size of the disc. It's a lot of drag. So if you have a twin engine aircraft, because they're usually out on the wings, you have drag out on the wing. It is, if you lose this engine, it, you're going to yaw, and this one's going to come around. You're just going to go into a spin, or you have trouble controlling it. you got to get rid of the drag. So you feather the propeller, which means that the propeller actually twists so that both blades are going directly into the earth. All, all the blades are going directly into the wind, and the engine will stop rotating. There's no this. They're so straight in. That's called feathering. And on feathering and, and prop control is done with engine oil. So imagine if you have a uh, aircraft that needs propeller or needs engine oil to feather it, and you just had a catastrophic engine failure that dumped all of your oil overboard, you are in big trouble because you cannot feather this particular prop. Now on modern engines, the prop will automatically feather, like you take a Cessna 310 or any of the, the twin engine aircraft that are modern, they take oil pressure to hold it out of feather. So should you lose oil pressure, springs or air pressure is gonna make it go to feather. My airplane's the opposite. Single engine, they're the opposite. It takes oil pressure to go towards high pitch. We'll get in that later. So now I'm getting ahead of myself. But in some of the old World War II type aircraft that used a hydromatic propeller that needed oil pressure to do everything, uh, low pitch, high pitch, feather. And so they actually used a secondary pump. We'll talk about it. But it, need, it needs oil. It needs an emergency supply of oil. And so what they did is they just took a, Imagine, if you will, if you take a sump, this is our oil sump, and you would put a standpipe like that, which would go two engine, no thanks, uh, two engine, right? And so there's your oil level, and should you have a catastrophic failure of your engine and it dumps all the oil overboard, the oil is going to go to this level right here, right? Yeah. Right, well, now you got to have an emergency reserve. Well, just do something like this. To prop, prop control, prop governor, and then you would have this emergency supply of oil left over. So, some of the tanks will have that. So you want to make sure you get the right one going to the engine, the right one going to the prop. But uh, chances of you working on an aircraft with a hydromatic propeller, unless you're working on some pretty old stuff, is pretty remote. Um, all right. So uh, the um, some aircraft. Uh, let's see, that would be like radials with a large supply of oil. Because we're talking quarts all the time, right? When you start working on radials, you talk gallons. How many gallons does it hold? It takes a lot of oil. 
Um, the smallest radial I ever worked on, the Stearman, the W670, which only was a 670 cubic inch, that's a seven cylinder radial. That thing held six gallons, right? That's a small radial. So, so you have a large supply. It takes a long time to heat this oil up. So if some uh, large, uh, use a hopper, use a hopper. Or it could be called a hopper or temperature accelerating well. And that what that is, it's like a tank within a tank. So tank. W, come on. Within. A tank. So what happens is within this oil tank that we have, we right, so got a big, we got the big old oil tank, and we'll say that uh, oil is going to come back this way, right? It's right there. This is uh, two tank. Well, rather than just dumping it into this gigantic tank that holds six or eight gallons of oil. What they will do is put inside the tank another tank with perforations in it, right? So what happens is you start it up and you've got this oil supply and it's drawing from over here, right? Yeah, two engine. So the oil comes back, except now it's, we'll use red because it's warm oil. Drip, where is it going to go? Oops, that's supposed to be like that. Okay, sure. So as this warmer oil comes in, rather than mixing with all of the other oil, it's going to come into this perforated tank that has holes in it, but they're not real big holes. And it's going to warm all this up real nice. Oops, my drawing was stupid because I should have, had, and, and this program isn't helping. I would have thought it through. Uh, the outlet's right here. Yeah, who this, this I know. Come on. Who did this? Yeah, let's tweak it out. All right. There we go. I'm just doing too much. All right. So two engine. So there we go. So now we have warm oil. It's going to go to the engine, right? Warmed up faster. And this perforation here, right here, this oil tank, that warm oil will then warm up this metal. And this metal, of course, radiates out, warms up this oil. Well, and of course, it's got holes in it, so a little bit of the cold oil mixes in there. But you're getting warm oil much faster. And as the oil near it warms up, it works its way into the holes that are created here, and that's the perforations, into here and goes out. So it's just a way to heat up a small amount of oil, but you still have a large quantity. You guys follow that, I hope? Yeah. All right. If you don't, I did my best. Let me see. Hopper is a well within a tank that allows a smaller amount of oil to be used in the engine and warm up. The warm oil then warms the remaining oil in the hopper. Warm oil in the main tank then flows into hopper through holes. There we go. All right. So we got, uh, let me see. Uh, we got our hopper. We got our tank. B. I have a question. All questions need to be submitted in writing. Yes, what's your question? So you said it has the... I always hate it when people say you said. It makes me nervous. Yes. And you said it has this perforated. Yes. So since it's made out of metal, the holes are relatively small. So as it warms up to allow for like better feed into the engine, do those holes begin to expand and start letting more cold oil into no. it? No. No. You know, you can make one. I mean, just imagine if you had a five-gallon bucket and a coffee can and you just drilled a whole bunch of eighth inch holes in the coffee can and put it there oil goes into the coffee can and it sucks out the bottom of the coffee can right so most of the oil goes into the coffee can with the holes and most of it sucked out the bottom of the coffee can with the holes follow but the other oil around it can get into those little holes and they will but for the most part you're blowing in hot oil and sucking it right out the bottom real quick and then the other oil just kind of slowly mixes and eventually it all becomes the same temperature but it's just a piece of steel with holes in it or aluminum. So they can't really get, 
doesn't have an aperture that opens and closes. See, all right, so we got the tank. Um, then oil is pumped into engine uh, by pressure pump. Before we go to the engine, what happens? Oil temp taken. Oil temp is taken. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, no, thanks. One of a blessing. Oil temp is taken as oil enters the engine. What's a good oil temp? 185. Yeah, 180. Want, they want at least 180. We want at least 180. They is we now. We want at least 180. Why do we want 180? Well, uh, that's the what water. the manufacturer said. Isn't that once you said, you said once they've got the engine, they actually get the bug, the boiling point? Right. We're going to add about another 20 to 30 degrees in there. So we want to do that. Now we're above boiling. So 180 going in. Add another 20, 25. We're going to hit 212. It's going to boil off. We don't want to know what it is coming out because that just frightens us. So we want to know what it is going in. So oil temps takes an the engine. We want it 180. Uh, let me see. Okay, oil pressure. Oil pressure is taken. Is taken um, off a gallery. Gallery is just another fancy word for a tube, tube. <laughs> a pressure tube. Or what do they call it? A header. Um, a, B, C, D. Oil runs through the engine. Same way as we've already studied. Runs through the engine. And falls into the sump. How much oil does the sump hold? Eh, not very much. Yeah. Okay, a couple quarts. A scavenge pump, a scavenger pump, which is usually run off the same shaft as the main pump, and it is also larger than the pressure pump. Why is it larger? More volume. Has more volume because the oil's been aerated, splashed, sprayed, aerated. So now it has more volume to it, and so we got to deal with that. So scavenge pump, larger than the pressure pump. Uh, pumps oil where? Mm. Cooler. Through the cooler and into the tank. Are the scavenge pumps the same design as the pressure pumps? They look exactly the same. Like the Continental, exactly the same. They're just longer. So, so the gears are just fatter and wider? Like there. Depth so regular pump, scavenge pump. Just like that. Oh, so it's taller. Well, if it's this way, it's taller. So that's that's how that you way know, it's wider. That's how you and know one is light gray. There you go. That'd be regular pump gear, scavenge pump gear. Okay. Except on a Continental 470. Yeah, that's that's like a regular gear, and that's like a scavenge pump gear. So they're 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 pretty big. They're three times these things. Might have be four. I mean, they're big. Uh, what was I going to say here? Something great. Uh, let me see. Oil flowing out of return line. Oh, I think this was a Q&A or something. Because it's weird. Oil flowing out. Uh, yes, it is something out of the Q&A. I would have never wrote this. Flowing out of return line is evidence. Engine is sufficiently pre-oiled. Back where you said you could see it actually on the gauge. 
that's what I would say. How do you know your engine's pre-oiled? Yeah, see it on the gauge. But it could be argued that a pressure gauge reads pressure. So if you had enough air pressure, it would just have air pressure and you'd be like, wow, I got good oil pressure. Well, you don't, you have air pressure, but that's not likely. So the point here is that if you were pre-oiling an engine, which you will all do with your engine, that is where you take all of the spark plugs out so it spins over quite freely and easily and you will either do it by hand and rotate the propeller which rotates the pump which draws the fluid out and goes through the engine you're just doing it by hand or you can use the starter i'm not going to let you use the starter because it'll just burn it up um, it goes through the engine and then if you pulled the cap off of the oil tank and looked in there and you could see oil flowing back around you would know it's pre-oiled that is not something I would do with the engine running. Go and start her up. I'm just going to, you know, no, no, thank you. You can do that. So why don't we use a pump? Why don't you what? Use a pump. Like an external pump? Yeah. I do. Why don't we use it? Just for lack of stuff. I've got some and they just didn't work that well. So I was trying to work on something else. But yes. I, all right. Uh, if, okay, this is one of the dangers. If oil line from scavenge pump, scavenge pump um, to oil cooler slash tank separates what happens? Yep, all oil will be pumped overboard. It's also I thought so. That's kind of why it's here. All right. Check valve does what? Low, no backflow. Back 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 check valve keeps oil in tank from seeping. into crankcase when engine is off. Oh, this is a lot to write. A leaky check valve will cause oil supply to seem low. Adding oil may cause tank to overflow when engine is started. So a leaky, leaky check valve. will cause oil supply to seem low adding oil may cause tank to overflow when engine is started. So don't do that thing. And my last point on this one, let me see, G, oil cooler. Oil cooler because we don't want to cool oil that's already cold and trying to warm up an engine. That just makes problems. <coughs> oil cooler has an oil control valve or sometimes called a flow control valve. Uh, or called vernotherm if it's a lycoming. Vernotherm valve. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, to bypass cold oil, to bypass cold oil directly to tank. And depending on the system, there's different kinds of oil coolers. 
So in some of these older ones, if oil is hot, valve sends oil through the core, sends oil through cooler core, which is where it gets its, its uh, heat transfer, right through the middle of it. If oil is cold, Uh, valve sends the oil around the outside of the cooler. So it's still flowing through the cooler. It's just either it goes through the fins where it gets it's cooled or on the, around the outside. There's like, it's like fins on the inside and then there's like a tube on the outside of it, isn't there? Well, no, just think about, I don't, know, I don't have an oil cooler, but oil, radiators on your car, oil coolers are just small okay. radiators. Uh, they have tanks on them. They're integral to it. So anytime you look at it, it's like um, like your car has like this tank on the top, you know, a little valve up here with the cap, and then it goes through all the cooling fins, right? Or like on the bottom for the transmission cooling. Yeah, so up here is the tank. So there's no cooling happens here, but it comes out of the out of here and then it goes through little tiny tubes to a tank on the other side. So I'm a terrible drawing, but so these little tiny tubes where everything has to run through and then the cooling fins are in there. And so it's the same thing with an oil cooler, exactly the same way. So you'd have a valve that could potentially, um, if the, it's cold, it's just going to come through the tank. You're going to have, it's different because I drew a radiator. You have an inlet and an outlet. So maybe it'll just go through here and then out. Right, but you could have a valve assembly over here where when it gets hot, it's going to come through here, then through the valve assembly, and then off through all the cooling. It's integral to it, or there's many passages ways through these, these uh, oil coolers. The valve sends oil through, cooler, um, well, sends oil through outside of cooler core. I know that can be a little confusing. Uh, these were some Q and A's I threw in there. So you just have to think about, you have a valve that controls the temperature of the oil. It's gonna do one of two things. If it's like a standard Lycoming, it's gonna get, or like my aircraft, uh, wet sump, it's gonna get to that oil control valve and either have an opening so it can go oil tank or engine, in which ways it gonna always wanna go pretty much. Engine, but a little bit's going to go through the oil, uh, the oil cooler, which is good because it warms up that oil. And if you have an icing issue, it won't allow it to ice up, right? Keeps the oil at least flowing through that cooler. But most of it's going to go through the engine until the oil control valve expands, blocking off a port. And then what does it do to the oil? All the oil goes through the cooler, then the engine. There's no other way. But then if you have one of these dry sump engines, especially one of these older ones where it's an integral tank, then what's going to happen is... The, it's the valve is different because now the oil comes out of the engine and it's got to go to the oil cooler, but we don't want it to get cooler. So what do we do? Run it around the outside of the oil cooler where there's no fins, then in the tank. But when it gets hot, run it through the middle of the oil cooler where the cooling fins are, then into the tank. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Test tomorrow. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know.